Coming up on Wrestling Life. I was an actor. It was like, you know, Robert De Niro in, you know, The Godfather, and then Robert De Niro in one of his comedy deals. It was, that's kind of how I was approaching it. And, and all my interviews, I really thought about, and I, 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 I thought about what would you say as a kid when I'm doing the interview? Would you be laughing at me or would you be cussing at me? Or, you know, and, and that's what was fun about it. I could, I could make people do what I wanted them to do. Welcome to Wrestling Life with Ben Veal, the show that features real talk from real talent. Well, we're here once again for another awesome conversation on Wrestling Life. And usually, this is the time when I would introduce my guest by the character or name that they're best known for. But um, with my guest today, it gets a bit tricky because there are so many personas to choose from. My guest is a three-time WWF Tag Team Champion as one half of iconic Tag Team Demolition. He portrayed one of the greatest characters of all time, in my opinion, as the Repo Man. He's also competed as the Blacktop Bully, Crusher Darso, Crusher Khrushchev, Mr. Hole in One, and many more. It is the one, the only, joining me on the show today, Barry Darso. Barry, thank you so much for your time today. How are you, sir? Ben, uh, thank you. I appreciate it. I'm doing fantastic. And yeah, like I told you earlier, I just moved up here to Michigan, up in the middle of nowhere, and I'm building a house, and I'm close to my son and three grandkids, and having the time of my life. And it's it's hard to go on the road, uh, you know, to do autograph deals and everything, but it's great to meet the fans too. So I'm I'm kind of torn between going on the road still and being home with the grandkids, you know. That's amazing. How old are your grandkids? Uh, one just turned eight, then 10, and then 12. So please, please tell me you've gifted them with Repo Man figures. Well, you know, it's funny. There's the youngest one's the only one that's into the wrestling. The other really? two aren't. And the youngest one has all the action figures and loves the Repo Man too. Yes. So, my kind of yeah. guy. Yeah. So, yeah, so why was... do you like the Repo Man so much? So, I got into wrestling in 1992. So that was the you know the peak in the UK. That was when we really went through that huge you know resurgence of the WWF, and yep. when when obviously SummerSlam 1992 came over that you're a part of, and. You know, for me as a kid, so I was eight years old and I was all about the larger than life kind of cartoonish characters. And for me, there were right. three that stood out and that I loved. That was Repo Man, Papa Shango and Tatonka. And, you right. know, the action figures, the characters, the vignettes, it just already, already sung to me. I mean, as time would go on, I would kind of gravitate more, I guess, to the kind of the workhorses of the industry in terms of like the technical yeah. bits. So then I'd, I was always a Bret Hart guy. I'd, I'd kind of gravitate more as it would go on to kind of Kurt Angle or Brian Danielson and, and that kind of thing. But when I, when I was young, it was all about the characters and the repo man was just, just everything really as a kid. So it's, it's, well, um, it's very cool to be doing this with you, sir. Well, I, I appreciate that. You know, when, when I became the repo man character, a lot of people said to me, are you sure you want to do that? You know, it's it's going to kill your wrestling career or whatever, you know. Well, I, I didn't really care, you know, what anybody said or what everybody thought or anything. I wanted to figure out how to do that character and be different than Smash or Crusher Khrushchev. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was really, uh, I was really acting a lot to be that character. But then after I did it, then everybody kind of got a kick out of, you know, laughing and kicking windows in and stealing bicycles from kids and everything. And then they thought, you know what, there could be something with this. And it ended up being where I wrestled all the top guys. And my job was to get guys over and have fun with it. And, and that's, that's why I enjoyed it a lot. Well, one of the one of the videotapes that I almost wore out from re rewatching. I think it was a Superstars uh, tape I had, Coliseum Home Video, but it was you versus Macho Man when you when you ran off with the winged eagle title and ran down the aisle of it and tried to steal it. And I just remember at the time being like, "Yes, Reaper Man, you become the champion." Yeah. And it's interesting because just imagine if a Reaper Man had been twenty years later and the and the twenty four seven title had existed, you would have you, you'd have never got away from that, would you? 
No, no. You know, what what's funny was when I did, uh, when I wrestled Savage, you know, he was really particular about his hat. He didn't mm-hmm. let anybody touch it or anything. So he didn't know I was going to steal his hat. So when I stole it, he really was chasing me. He wanted to kill me, I think, you know. But I never laughed so hard in my life when he was chasing me around. And he couldn't catch me. And that's what was funny. And he's way <laughs> faster than I was, you know. So I had a lot of fun with that. How how was Randy to work with? Because I've you know I've heard many many say how intense he was, and that the kind of matching man you saw on screen wasn't that different to the, the the Randy Savage behind the scenes. You know, Randy was just like every other wrestler. You know, just everybody has their different things they do, and if you if you are a good worker and you can work with everybody, it doesn't matter if they're intense or whatever. You just become intense with them. And then you try you try to slow them down and relax them. And he was a great worker, you know, when he really wanted to be. And we we just had some great matches together. It was fun. It's interesting what you say about the kind of pe- people questioning your decision to become the repo man after you'd had the run with demolition. Um, we're jumping all over the place. We'll come back to all of the early days, but. You know, I, I guess there's one school of thought that that might not be a main event kind of role, but there's right. a re- you know I always see. I think Bret Hart's talked about this before, saying about wrestling as like a, a a menu, and that there's different dishes, you know, for different times. And you know, for me, there's a there's really important roles to be had in the mid card, the upper mid card, you know, a bit of light relief, you know, giving something for all the all the crowd and. You know, I think characters such as, you know, such as the Reaper Man were so important in terms of, as you say, that kind of that kind of glue of the show in terms of yeah. giving giving the top face of someone to work with, um, you know, but also having something there for the kids. I mean, I felt like I was spoilt for choice being a, a young fan right. in, in the early 1990s. There were just so many different kind of, you know, like action figures to play with almost you know these larger than life characters that were just so colorful and fun and um I, i'm not sure that that's something that's maybe been lost a bit in the modern product but um certainly back in the back in the day it was just such a so much fun to watch as a child yeah you know you know it's funny that you know i, I was lucky with my career you know I, I broke in the business with the road warriors and rick rude we were all in the same camp and all of us really kind of made our name in wrestling somewhere somehow but when i started off you know um after about a year i was already a tv champion then i was you know partners with nikolai volkoff and jim the anvil nightheart and i was tag team champions and then with ivan nikita we were the world champions tag team you know usa champions and then demolition that was you know i finally reached my goal into getting into the wwf at the time and became the tag team champion so all of that you know you i wasn't into you know being the champion or anything that wasn't something that i had to have or anything it was just being in wrestling for me was the greatest so when when i met with vince after the demolition you know just you know parted its ways with each other um he asked me he says what what would you want to do and I, and i took about a week or two to think about it and, you know, I could have been a rough and tough, you know, figure. But then I just would have been smashed again. Why not just stay smashed? So I told him I used to repo cars. And he goes, oh, really? Well, maybe you should be the repo man. And I said, you know, I've been thinking about it. And then, like you're saying, at that time, it was all characters. So it was like, how could you be a character and stand out without being like anybody else? And then it was kind of like, you know, Batman, the Riddler, you know? Yeah. And, and so then that's why I said, why don't, why don't I become that repo man that sneaks around, has that mask? Nobody knows who I am, but they really do know who I am. And then later on, we can take the mask off and then I can be that rough and tough repo man. And then I'll be a baby face because at that time of my career, I really wanted to do stuff for Make a Wish and you know and being the biggest heel where kids hate you for treating them so bad once you turn good they're going to love you more than anybody. Mm. That's that was my train of thought. 
And when I told Vince that, he says, Vince, or he goes, Barry, I love that. So that's how I became the repo man. And, and I told him, I said, I don't need to be Hulk Hogan or this or that. I would rather be the guy to wrestle those guys and have good matches and make them. Because for so many years, I had people making me, you know, and it was time for me to do that. And I didn't know how much longer I had in my career because I was already hurting my, you know, I had five knee surgeries, I've shoulder surgery. I've had so many surgeries already. I just thought, well, I'm going to go out and have fun doing this. And there was no pressure. I didn't have to have the greatest match. I didn't have to be the champion, you know. I just had to go out and have fun and get the guy over. And that's what I think I did really well. How how much of a transition was it then from being, you know, obviously in Demolition, um, you know, you and Axe would have lots of matches with enhancement talent who would make you look great. You know, you, you kind of steamrolled three people often. And then you become a repo man. And as you say, your job is, you know, to essentially be the the kind of cowardly heel that runs away from yeah. people and makes makes yeah. them look like stars. How much was the transition was that for you to because that's a very different kind of um role to play, isn't it, in the ring? Yeah, it it was it was a really a major thing. It, you know, it's I was an actor. It was like, you know, Robert De Niro in, you know, The Godfather, and then Robert De Niro in one of his comedy deals. It was that's kind of how I was approaching it and and all my interviews I really thought about and I, I I I thought about what would you say as a kid when I'm doing the interview would you be laughing at me or would you be cussing at me or you know and and that's what was fun about it I could I could make people do what I wanted them to do you know what I mean so it, it was a whole different mindset than just going out and beating people up and and doing that you, you know it, it was fun it was really fun yeah, and and you could and you could see. I mean, the fact that we're here talking about it thirty years on, the fact that you know you created such a such an impression on me as a as a youngster, and that you know I'm still smiling about it thirty years on. So, you know, you can see the fun that you had in that role. You can't you can't fake that. You could see the joy that you were having as the repo man. Now, now, did you hate me when you saw me, or did you like me? No, I loved. I I, I was all about the repo man. Sorry, <laughs> but I mean, when you when you first saw it, did you go? I can't stand that guy. What what do you do? You know, like when you saw the vignettes, when I kicked the car window in or when I stole the kid's bike or. I think I was still a fan, to be honest. I think I've always, I I've, maybe I've always gravitated towards the, uh, I think I've always been more drawn towards villains, to be honest, in wrestling and in films. You're talking about the Joker. I've always found the Joker right. far more interesting than Batman. So I right. think for me, you know, if it had been you against, if it had been Reaper Man versus Hulk Hogan, I know who I would have been rooting for. Um, yeah. It, which is probably the only different. The only time that changed is when it was you against a British bulldog, and then obviously there was there was no contest. It was Davy Boy all the way. Right, right. <laughs> well, you know, it, it's kind of funny because uh, I, I liked the Riddler and I liked the Penguin, and you know, always the bad guys. I I always liked them more than anybody, and I think that's kind of why I got in that role so so easy, and you know, it, it, that's why it was so fun. Absolutely. So look, I was going to ask you, we were talking, we were talking off air. So we, we had a chance to meet briefly um, over the chaotic WrestleMania 40 weekend in Philly. And um, I mean, I was, I was there live. I mean, what an incredible spectacle it is and what a kind of huge week long city takeover it's become. Um, yeah, now you, of course, by were involved in, in a few WrestleManias, pretty most notably um, in 1990 in the Toronto Skydome when, when you and Axe, uh, won your third tag team title how how different is the wrestlemania experience now compared to when you saw it in its in its infancy in the early 90s you know uh back then i think it was just you know there was only a couple pay-per-views in a year and and in fact i think there was only like three of them at the time mm. so the wrestlemania was the big blowout of the whole year of all the guys you wrestled, all the angles, everything you did, that was the blowout of it. And it was huge for us because we didn't know anything that these guys do now. I mean, it was, you know, so it was a huge show for us. But now it's it's such a big entertainment with all the movie stars and all the blitz and the glamour. And, and each one of the wrestlers now 
our stars. Where mm. back when we wrestled, there was, you know, the five or six, eight, ten stars, and then the rest were just wrestlers. Now it's almost like everybody is a star. Mm. And that was the one thing that I thought that Vince McMahon was a genius about, is he could make a star. If he wanted, Ben, if he wanted you to be the world champion and be the best, he could make you the world champion and you'd be the best. I'm I'm I'm, I'm down with, I'm down with that. That's fine. You're down with that. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's how good he was though at it, and I don't think people really realized it. And he had, you know, dozens of people behind the scenes that helped him do that. But it's it was his vision to make it what it is and to get it as large as it is now. Mm -hmm. I mean, the TV is so big now. It's I mean, you know, you got The Rock. He's in all the movies. One of those highest paid TV stars around, you know, Cena, you know, it just, it's, it's incredible how much bigger it is now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I don't get to go to, you know, in the back and see what's going on and everything, but I can just imagine how, you know, these guys are now they're, they're all stars. Mm. And of course they have a, there's a fundamental difference between when you were in the ring and now is that they all have the ability to create their own content and market themselves via social media. I mean, imagine how different it would have been if you'd been able oh, yeah. to, if you'd had Instagram and were able to upload short videos and promo. Imagine, imagine the repo man on TikTok. That would have been wonderful. I'd have liked to have seen that. Oh my that. gosh. It was just the funny stuff that the repo man did. Yeah. It would have, it would have really been something, you know, and one of my favorite characters after we were all done was, uh, Santino. Mm. Yes. Remember Santino's Tremendous. character? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I, when I was in England uh, last year, we were in Liverpool, and he was there. And I, I met him once before, but I didn't, I didn't know him or anything. And I came up to him, and I said, you're my favorite character that I've ever seen. And he looked at me, and he started laughing. He goes, you serious? I said, yeah. I said, I, I'm a character guy. And then we started talking about the Repo Man a little bit, and, you know, different things. But I just loved his character and how he worked. And it when you watch the TV show, that was just something that you remembered was Santino. Even if it was The Undertaker and somebody else's match, Bret Hart, you always remembered the Santino man. Mm. You know? Yeah. And that's kind of how I wanted to be with the Repo Man. That's yeah. I, yeah. And I, I think there's a, there's a real art to that. I mean, you know, it would have been all too easy for you to have just been tough guy smash after after demolition, right. and you'd have, you had that legitimacy. It would have been, you know, we saw how quickly Crush was able to transfer that. You know, it would have right. it would have been it wouldn't have been hard at all for you to just be smash and to smash people. And but, but there's a ceiling to that, isn't there? Before the fans tire of that act, um, right. I think that I think the the characters that stand the test of time are the ones, as you say, like Santino. I think we're seeing that now in 2024 with our truth, who has had an incredible career and is probably right. you know 20, 25 years into into the business is probably one of the most over acts in WWE today. There's there's something to be said for that brilliant kind of comedic light relief character who can also right, turn it on in the ring when it matters. Yeah. But what I can't believe now they got WrestleMania two nights. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, as big as WrestleMania was way back, you know, at the sky dome and all that. Now they got two nights of that. That's how big wrestling is. And yeah. it's just phenomenal. And it, you know, it, it makes you proud to say, Hey, I was a wrestler, you know, you're not embarrassed to say that. No, and even, even back when we were wrestling, a lot of times somebody said, hey, what do you do for a living? You kind of had to think, you know, well, I was a pro wrestler because some people just hated wrestling. Mm -hmm. You know, now if you say you're a pro wrestler, it's like, oh, you're one of those guys. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. You're larger than life to a lot of people. And 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 you could tell what you know, when I when I stopped by your table and we had a we had a chat at, at WrestleCon in Philly and. You know, of course, I, I wasn't leaving without some signed, you know, Repo Man memorabilia. But um, you, you could just tell the, 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 the kind of fans, the adult fans coming up to you and Bill, you could just see the, um, you know, the love and respect that they've got for, for you as a team. And um, I guess that's something that's quite different now as well to the fan experience 20 years ago. This, this ability to have conventions, this ability to walk up to people that you right. loved on screen 20 years ago and have great conversations like this with them that's that's really special i think what's it like for you as a as a talent to do those those kind of conventions and sign-ins now well it, it's incredible uh you know the fans it's it's they're all like you are you know they're 
they're uh, they're coming to see their wrestlers that they loved back 20 and 30 years ago and they they know everything about your whole life i mean you know they'll come up with things that they'll talk about matches that you forgot about and bring it up to you and it's just like oh yeah i remember that now you know and it's funny how much that everybody remembers and we've done it so many times we forget so many different things but you know it's fun talking to the fans about the old time stuff and bring up the memories. I mean, it's really neat. Yeah, it's, it's really cool. You, you could you could tell people having a blast meeting you both, and I think you could tell that you were also really enjoying speaking with the fans. Yeah, I just I wish it was just easier to get to the events. You know, it's the planes and the, the you know the the trips to get to these places. You know, it takes a day to get there and a day to get home, and you're only spending four or five hours at the show, and that's what kills you it's just the traveling you know the seats are so small the you know there it seems like every flight's late and it's it's brutal and i'm i'm three hours to the airport i gotta drive Mm. you know so yeah i think i think that's why we're seeing a lot of kind of um talent from your era um doing virtual signings now and much more kind of trying to take things online i think probably to avoid those i mean you did so much traveling didn't you back in the day and oh probably the last thing you want to do is be on a on a plane if you can avoid it now. Yeah, you know, my wife will say, hey, let's go on a trip. Well, uh, you know, a trip, where? where? You know, let's go to the store and, you know, Walmart 20 miles away. That's my favorite trip now. I don't want to drive <laughs> 300 and fly for five hours and stay in a hotel room, you know. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, yeah, life is good, though, Ben. I'll tell you, I can't complain. No, it's good. It's it's good stuff. Sounds like you're you're enjoying the, you know, the right things in life now. Enjoying being out in nature, enjoying your grandkids, enjoying home right. building, just all the all the good stuff in life. Well, now what what town do you live in? So I'm in I'm near Bath. So I'm on the, on in the southwest of England. So lots of That's very right, rural, right. yeah, very rural, beautiful area. We we're talking off air about kind of deers in the field. I usually wake up with with deers in the backfield to my house. So probably very similar to you, just across the Atlantic. Well, I am uh, trying to plan a trip to London again here, so hopefully I'll see you there. I, I really, Absolutely. really enjoy the UK. I mean, it's the people are great. The beer is good. Um, you know, great, great fans. So when we were in Liverpool, we had such a good time. And, uh, you know, you, you see guys that you haven't seen in a while. Like we spent some time with Kevin Nash in Liverpool, and, and I love him. He's He's the greatest guy. And we just laugh, you know, and so it's it's fun trip. So I can't wait to get back there again. Uh, we'd, we'd, we'd love to have you over here again. And uh, there's def- definitely a few beers on me. I, I got, um, I was over here a few, um, a few months ago. Mark Merrow was over here with me and we were doing, doing the convention here and I got him into IPA. And um, he keeps, he keeps saying to me, ah, oh, you've got good, you've got good beer over there in the UK. So, um, you know, I'll get it. I'll get you a few pints in Barry when you come over. Well, I love it. I love it. I love it. But one thing I have learned though from bitter experience now is don't try and out drink a wrestler because I tried to out drink Al Snow when he was over here, and I had a I had a very bad night on that one. I, it's very easy to overlook that you guys are actually a lot bigger than me. We might be the same height, but um, you, you can take <laughs> you can take a lot more. And obviously, you came from the era that was a much more seasoned drinkers as well than me. Well, Al, Al Snow is a good one too. Yeah, I love Al. What what a show he had on Netflix, huh? Incredible, absolutely incredible. Yeah, I yeah. I didn't see him for probably six months or so, and I saw him at WrestleMania. I pulled him aside and I said, Al, I'm really proud of you for you know creating that show and being on Netflix. And he said, Barry, I really appreciate it. And I said, you know, you made me proud to say I was a professional wrestler because mm. that was such a well you know put together show that you know talking about that was like the old school like how i was brought up and mm. i i thought that was a great show in the end it was and i think shows like that is it's the same as when wwe has done these spin-off shows reality shows any way that you can try and get a casual audience to understand and appreciate the art form of wrestling the better um, you know, I think you couldn't have gone away from watching wrestlers without understanding the sacrifices that people have to make right. to make it into this business. And the fact that, 
yes, there is WrestleMania and there are 90,000 stadiums, but there's also wrestling in front of 50 people to, right. you know, kind of get your get your reps in and to and to build your and, and what goes into being a wrestler and how hard it is. And I think I think that, right. that show, I mean, I hope I hope that show gets another season. I hope it can continue. I think there was a lot of stories there that were yeah. half told and, and we could do more with. But um, yeah, I, I came away from it the same. I've recommended it to so many people, um, including my wife, who who Barry can't stand wrestling. Um, she really can't. She's she spent twenty years married to me almost, and has just had to put up with wrestling for that time. But I'm trying right. to get her to watch it because I said there's so many good characters in there um, right. that I think she'd actually genuinely enjoy it just as a as a really good piece of television. Yeah, the only thing I think is going to hurt that show is now the WWE is going to be on Netflix. Mm. And there's going to be so many spin-offs on there that I think that's going to kind of take away from Al's show, you know, which mm. is really unfortunate because you know, the WWE is so big, everybody wants to watch them. And when you get a smaller show like what they have with the Ohio wrestling, it just isn't the same. So I, I hope that doesn't take away from it. I hope so. And I also hope for, for kind of talent like yourself, you know, I hope that this the bit that isn't known about this Netflix deal at the moment, which is incredible, but is about how much of the archived content is going to transfer over. You know, the fact that right. preparing preparing for, for this show, I could go back and find, you know, you know, WrestleMania six and, and rewatch that match with you, but I could look for a specific episode of Monday Night Raw from 1993. Um, right. I hope that there's still going to be that rich archive of, you know, lots of the old territory systems. And because that for me was what's been so special about the WWE network has been right. not the current product, but the, you know, I got rid of all my videotapes. I wish I hadn't now, but you know, when right. the network came in, I went digital and thought it's all going to be online forevermore. And I, I really hate that you can still find the, you know, what I would say the golden era of the eighties and the nineties, with, with ease on the on netflix right right i i had boxes of vhs tapes and then then i i put those aside and then you got the dvds and then now you put those aside it's like you don't even need any of them anymore no no you know you're on peacock and you, you watch wrestlemania live you know why you know i don't know what you spend for tickets but uh it cost me thirteen ninety nine or whatever to watch it. Yeah, a, a lot. It was a, it was a once in a lifetime trip, WrestleMania. But I'm glad I did it. But yeah, it's a lot cheaper to just stay at home in the UK and watch it with with a few beers and friends. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I want to I want to ask you about um about your 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 time in in Crockett because obviously before you came to WF you had that you have the run with with Jim Crockett Promotions and you, you talked earlier about some of the experience that you got and some of the names that you got to work with. But how fundamental was that to kind of getting you ready for the bright lights of the WWF? Well, it was huge. Um, you know, when I, when I first started wrestling, I wrestled for Mrs. Maivia. That's the rock's grandmother. I wrestled for her in, in, uh, the Blaisdell in Honolulu. And my first match was with maniac Mark Lewin. And when I locked up with him, he looked at me and, and I was like 325 pounds and I was a monster back then. Power lifter, you know, 800 pound squatter, wow. dead lifter. You know, I was, I was strong. So when I locked up with him, he said to me, he pushed me back and he goes, and my name was Zar Mongo then. He says, Zar, he goes, take it easy. You know, and I went, what do you mean? I was so nervous. I was ready to tear his head off, you know, and we ended up having a match and I, I wrestled him, I don't know how many times, and I was in New Zealand, and, you know, I was over there for about six months, and I thought I was the greatest wrestler of all time at that time, you know? Yeah. So then I, I left there, and I came home, and I and I met with uh, Dusty Rhodes down in Florida Championship Wrestling, and he sent me to Atlanta with Ole Anderson. So then I had a few matches there, and I learned more, and I thought, well, I'm so much better now than I was in Hawaii. Then he sent me to Bill Watts down in Louisiana in Mid-South. That's where I really learned how to wrestle. So I was there for about a year or so, and then I thought, well, shoot, I could be up in the big leagues. I, I'm I'm the best now, right? Yeah. So then I got to Florida, and I was partners with Jim Neidhart, and we wrestled the Freebirds, and we wrestled you know, all the big-name guys. And 
I thought, well, I'm ready to go to the WWF now. I'm the best, right? So I get to I get to Crockett Promotions and I get with Ivan Koloff. He taught me so much. It was like I never even wrestled before. Right. And just being around him and being around Dusty and Ric Flair and and you know all these top guys down there, I learned so much. That's when I really learned my craft. So Jim Crockett Promotions really helped me out. But, you know, I, I always learned that whenever a promoter tells you something, you trust him, you believe in him. And if they ever lie to you or cheat, cheat you, you have to confront them and you have to be willing to quit. Well, mm. that's what happened to me down there. He He lied to me and he cheated me out of a payoff. And ended up being where I, I quit the the business. And I always went in, you know, there's life after the wrestling business. And I've always been a hard worker, you know, doing whatever I do outside the business. So when I when I left Crockett's territory, now I really knew I was a real professional wrestler. I could wrestle anybody, have a good match with anybody, do whatever I want. Uh, my promos weren't the best, but I could get by with them. And then uh, Ricky Steamboat, I was in his gym one day, and and he says, Barry, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. I'm just going to take a break. You know, I'm married now. I like to, you know, have some kids and everything. And he says, hey, you want me to call Vince? I said, yeah, yeah, go ahead. And then Earl Hebner says, he was our referee. He says, let me call Dave Hebner, who was a referee up in, in New York. So I had these two guys in Vince's ear saying, hey, you got to hire Barry. He quit down there. He's a young guy who can work and all this stuff. Well, about three or four days later, then Vince McMahon calls me up and says, uh, hey, Barry, I'd like to meet you up here. Can you can you come up here? And right away, I, I made like I'm looking at a schedule. You know, well, I'm really busy, Vince. I don't know. But, you know, when do you want me? He says, I'll have a flight for you tomorrow morning. I says, I'll be there. Wow. So. So being in Jim Crockett promotions and wrestling Ricky Steamboat and the Rockers and, you know, the Rock and Roll Express, I mean, all these guys that Vince knew everything about me before I even got up there. That's so amazing. that's how much the Crockett promotions helped me to get in up there. So I, I had instant credibility. Did did Vince have a vision for you? Because, of course, you, you'd you'd come in with demolition, but you weren't the original smash were you for a, a first few right. matches so so did vince know where he wanted to put you or was it more that he you have a reputation he knew that you, he needed you on his roster somewhere well he knew right away that he had me for the demolition character um when randy didn't work out bill you know bill has told the story many times he, he went to vince and he said vince this isn't going to work and randy knew it wasn't going to work because everybody knew who randy was so they needed to get somebody that the New York audience didn't know. And that was me because, you know, back then it was like the the New York audience watched, you know, Vince's show, Crockett's watched their show, AWA watched their show. You know, it was like you had those certain fans. And there was a couple of fans that could see every, every TV show. Mm. But uh, when he brought me in, he made me sign a non-compete deal. And and I didn't know anything about the demolition or anything, what it was going to be. So he showed me this book with the characters all drawn out with spikes and this and that and everything. And and he says, would you want to be part of that? And I told him, I, my, I said, I would, my biggest thing is I want to work for you. Whatever character or gimmick you give me, I'm going to make it work. You know, and he says, well, I really like you to do this. And I said, I would love it. I said, count me in. And I said, who's my partner going to be? Because, I, you know, I didn't, like I said, I didn't watch it. So he says it would be Bill Eady. And I said, the mass Superstar. He says, yes. And I was a mass Superstar fan forever, you know. And I, and I met Bill a couple times in Atlanta on some big shows. And, you know, all my friends knew him. So I knew shoot, if he's going to be my partner, this is going to be like Ivan Koloff, you know. This is going to be like, you know, yeah. Nikolai Vol Like, they're top guys that I'm hooking up with. It's not just 
a bottom guy and we we're going to create a team and make sure, you know, see if it's going to work. Vince wanted to push this and make it work. Mm. So Vince said, he goes, well, Barry, the one thing I got to do is I got to talk to Bill to make sure he's all right with you being his partner. So I went home and then Bill called me up a couple of days ago and he says, hey, Barry, he says, you want to be my partner? And I said, you're darn right I do. Whatever you want, you're the you're the captain of the team. You just tell me what you need. And it ended up working out just perfect. Everything, we got along and we're still together. You know, almost 40 years later, we still go on the road and do autographs together. And, you know, he's like my big brother. What's, what's been so, the key to your, to your friendship, do you think, over these years? I, I think it's because neither of us have ever been greedy you know like in in the matches it didn't matter if he got beat or i got beat or if i beat somebody it was all a team effort all the way and bill's a a, a pretty clean cut guy you know he's a married man kids he he didn't go out drinking and partying all the time and and i needed that because i used to be the drinker and the partier and all that over all the years and so when I when I got up there, it was business all the way, and he helped me out so much that way. And and I respect Bill big time. You know, even this even to this day, when we get into a car, I'll say, Bill, you want you want the front seat, you know? And he says, No, you take it. And he lets me do it because you know I'm bigger than he is, and I can't fit in the dang back seats, you know. Yeah. But just as respect, I always ask him for it you know what i mean he's he's the veteran i'm still the young boy at 65 <laughs> i love that i love that and we, we were talking earlier about obviously the repo man because the repo man is where i was first introduced to you but of course um as as i kind of got more into wrestling you know 93 94 95 and then obviously i started going back and seeing what i'd missed from the 1980s and i remember how much demolition stood out to me the very first time i i, I kind of laid eyes on on you and bill you know the the look the intensity the presentation the music you know it's just all there um how, how much fun did you have as part of demolition because it looked like it was an absolute blast it was uh, i had a great time it was it was probably the easiest gimmick to do because it was it was kind of like every guy's dream is to be able to just beat up people and scream <laughs> and yell and and be the bad guy so it was it was a pretty easy thing to do for me and and it it was fun but I'll tell you starting out you know in the WWF at the you know I'll say that cuz that was the name mm -hmm. back then but you know that's every wrestler's dream is to finally wrestle for that cuz that's the big the big gun that's Madison Square Gardens Boston Gardens you know so the first day I get in there I, I was only like 24 or 25 years old so I've only been in the business for about five years. And uh, I walk in the dressing room, and the first guy I meet is, you know, Jimmy Superfly Snuka. You know, then Don Morocco and Paul Orndorff, Hulk Hogan, Andre the Giant, you know. And I'm a mark for these guys because being in the smaller wrestling organizations, you're always looking at these guys on TV, and you're going, oh, my God, you know. So that was the first time I in my life I was ever like, holy shit you know i'm with these guys shaking hands with them and they automatically liked me because i was with the mass superstar and i was his partner mm -hmm. so i had i had some you know a little bit of credibility being there and they all knew that we're going to get a push to be somebody so now the hardest part was you had all these tag teams were the greatest tag teams ever mm. and now there's a new team being created by vince mcmahon and everybody knows uh oh we got a new tag team that they're going to push and they're going to start beating everybody so you had to get in the ring and you had to wrestle them but yet be strong enough to look like you were better than them mm -hmm. you know what i mean without having them get mad at you because you needed them to help you get over Mm. and you know you had to pull teeth with some people and and uh it got to be tough but after about six months or so then the other teams really knew hey the demolition we can have some good matches with these guys so then pretty soon 
it was easy matches with everybody. And then we became champions. Then they all wanted to work with you because, you know, we had good matches with everybody. Mm -hmm. And that's what everybody wanted to have. Even though you didn't have the belt, if you had a good match, it gave you credibility and they made more money. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and they say that, you know, they say either the belt makes a wrestler or if a wrestler makes a belt. And I would say that Demolition were one of those acts that didn't need for tag team titles. Like you have them three times. You set records and you were the longest reigning champions for a long time. But um, yeah. you didn't. I don't think you necessarily needed them because I think that act was so over. And I think you came in at that time. You know, theme music was still relatively new. I mean, yeah. you, you had such an earworm for a for an entrance music. I could still sing it instantly to this day. Um, you know, you had such a great entrance, such a great look. You know, very much kind of part of that rock and wrestling movement that was where wrestling went so mainstream in you know mid eighties. And um, but you also, as you say, you were probably a tag team at the at the very best time that ever was for tag teams in in wrestling. Yeah. There were in the mid in the late eighties in WWF. There were so many incredible future Hall of Famers that propped up that tag team division. Is there is there right. one team that kind of you feel above all others you gelled with or you loved working with more than anyone else? But I tell you, there's just so many of them. You know, we 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 had such good matches with everybody, and you know the Hart Foundation. We had phenomenal matches with them and you know i i best friends with brett and i was best friends with jim neidhart and you know when jim neidhart passed away i mean it was just terrible mm. but uh you know the bulldogs it, we tore the houses down with the bulldogs it it just you know there was just any tag team that was there could have been the the champions mm. that's how good everybody was so we we were very lucky to be able to work with these guys, but you know it's hard to pick one team who you had the best matches or had the most fun with. But you know the Bulldogs and the Hart Foundations were right there at the top. You know, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. The the, the other thing I was going to ask about demolition was, um, you know, our, our mutual friend Brian Clark. You know, him and I have shared lots of stories about the late great Brian Adams, obviously better known to WWF fans as Crush. Um, yeah, and he and he would he would become that third member of of demolition. Um, what 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 I've always been curious. What was the rationale behind that? And also, what what was Brian like, kind of in outside of the ring? Obviously, we all know him inside as this large than life tough competitor. But what was he like in in real life? Well, when uh, you know we were really at the peak of our you know tag team, and uh, Axe got got real sick he almost died um really and he was in the hospital and we had you know probably two to three months of bookings already booked in advance with all these teams so there had to be another member of a tag team to keep that three months going and brian was just uh you know on the wwf's radar you know big guy he broke in in Japan. He was a good worker, a good guy from what everybody said. So they, they came up to me and said, hey, we got a new partner for you. What do you think of Brian Adams? And I never met Brian before. I met him at TV and we sat and talked. And right away, I liked him. I mean, he was he was just like us. He was just a really, really good guy. Mm-hmm. And he was willing to listen, you know, because it was already a, a veteran tag team. So we didn't want somebody that was to come and change anything so he came came right in and worked worked right with us mm. and he was one of the funniest guys that i've ever known outside the ring he ribbed people and there were good ribs you know uh phone calls that you know I, I mean i just can't remember even half the stuff he did but he was always a real quiet guy and then all of a sudden he'd get him going and he was just the funniest guy and the things he would do was just incredible. But uh what a what a really, really nice guy. Yeah, I think that, that echoes exactly what Brian's told me, just you know, the life life and soul of the party, a joy to be around in the locker room. Um yeah. just a, a a gentle giant. But also when you when you look at a kind of if you look at an archetypal kind of what would Vince McMahon be looking for out of a WWF superstar in 1990, I mean, they don't come much more out of a mold than you know, the Brian Adams Steve in terms, you know, he was just a, a giant right. of a man, great look, just, you know, you see superstar as soon as you see him. 
Yeah, but what what a terrible situation for him to start off with, though. You know, you you got the demolition, who's the top tag team, been you know champions and everything, and all of a sudden you're a new guy in the business coming right in and and having to make up you know a spot where Axe isn't in there anymore. You're kind of breaking the tag team up and coming in there. He did a really, really good job for the position he got put in. Mm -hmm. And and he wasn't nervous or anything like that. He was, you know, it was kind of like when I came in, just excited to be there and excited to be in the top top deal and very respectful for everybody. But, you know, when you got 50, 75 wrestlers in a territory that are there and all of a sudden you're there, it's hard to get respect for all those people where they all like you, you know? Mm -hmm. And it didn't take long, and everybody loved Crush. I mean, he was just that kind of a guy, you know? But it could be tough, I guess, as you say, coming in new to a big money spot, to an established, marketed spot, when there's other guys on the roster who I'm sure would have killed to have kind of slotted into Bill's role for a spell. Yep, yep. It was a tough situation, but he, he did really well. I just hate that the demolition, you know, you know, broke up at the time and everything. And and I don't really know how it happened or what it is. I, you know, I, I can't remember half the stuff that goes on anymore. But I think the demolition could, you know, could have been there forever. But yeah. you know, when the Road Warriors came in, they wanted the Road Warriors over, and they didn't want the demolition over anymore. And that's that's how it worked. Mm -hmm. You know. We, we we were talking before before we started recording as well about you know I mean I would say demolition have to be one of the most glaring omissions from the WWE Hall of Fame and it, you know in my opinion not that I have any any sway in the game and I have no idea how it all actually is 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 kind of selected but for me it's surely got to only be a matter of time before demolition are are in the Hall of Fame for the for the sheer impact you had for for so long. Well, I appreciate those words, but you know. You you never, you never know what's going to happen. You know, like we're talking, there's so many great tag teams. Um, do I think the demolition should be in the Hall of Fame? I think so someday, and and hopefully maybe next year. Mm. But uh, you know, like we were talking, I think there's a committee of people, and they all bring up their favorite tag team and why they should be in there. And and you know, the bottom line is. Is it going to be exciting enough for the fans to say, hey, I want to stay for the Hall of Fame and watch it? And, you know, I, I think that has a lot to do with it. And, um, you know, who knows? You well, know, I, look, I, I think so. Judging by the reception of so many people that I saw coming up to your table in Philly, I have no doubt that there would be a huge um, uproar of support for, for you two walking down the aisle again, especially if you come out in the... Um, Leather singlets again. That would be a. Oh, I don't think that would be a sight. We won't, we won't look very good in that. But <laughs> that, you know, I'll that, tell you that what, would draw some ratings. Yeah, not some good ones for us though. But <laughs> anyways, I, what was really nice is uh, the WWE office called me and they called Bill, and they invited us to the Hall of Fame, and they invited us to WrestleMania, and you know, I when the. When the secretary called me about it, I, I told her, I said, I really got to think about this. Can you email me all the information? And because we, we had somebody who brought us in and flew us in, paid for our hotels, you know, we were there to make money for him. And we didn't think it was fair to him for us to leave and go to the, you know, WrestleMania and go to, to their shows. You know, and fans are taking pictures of you and this and that and, you know, when he paid for everything. So mm. I was very appreciative to, to the WWE, but that's kind of why we didn't show up. Otherwise, we would have been there, you know. Yeah, that makes sense. Certainly one thing I've learned a lot from talking to, to a lot of talent about conventions is, you know, is when you come over for a convention, you are brought in under a contract and any any yep. photographs, any autographs signed, they really need to happen at the convention, don't they? If you're if you're there out on the streets taking selfies with people, you're you're kind of working against the person right. that's brought you in for that show. So it's quite a hard balance to strike because I'm sure you don't want to turn down a photograph or an autograph of a fan who remembers you, but equally it, you've been brought exactly. in. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, if they would have called us, 
you know, in fact, for next year, they got to call us here pretty soon because we're already booked all the way up till next year. I mean, you know, we try to only take two bookings a month, but it ends up being three. And sometimes you're working every weekend. We don't want to work that much. But they, you know, if they can call ahead of time and say, hey, can you, can you go to WrestleMania and come to the Hall of Fame and sit in the audience and do it? Then we would love to. But, you know, you can't have somebody else pay to bring you in then you go to their show that just isn't fair no but i think it's but, it's definitely a but, mark of respect that you're being invited by wwe but you're yeah. still clearly a beloved part huge, of the family huge because over all the years nobody's ever invited us to that before and it could be because vince isn't there anymore and triple h i've met him quite a few times before um you know got along with him and he's a good guy so it's kind of a new a new, a whole new realm, and he's looking at things differently than how Vince was. So mm. maybe that will give us the opportunity of getting in there. Yeah, know? and I mean, a lot's been, a lot was made over WrestleMania of 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 the Paul Levesque era, and rightly so because a WWE without Vince McMahon is is still such a, a crazy concept to wrap your head around. Um, but he very much strikes me as someone who's got a huge amount of respect for you know the paths that pave the way for the current generation. Yep. And we've also seen with, you know, with various deals he helped to, to broker with, you know, various talents who at one point or another had fallen out with the WWF and had lawsuits with the Federation. You know, we've seen that he's done a lot in terms of trying to mend fences. And, yeah. and you know, and, and, and the thing is, wrestling, wrestling fans have very long memories. And, you know, yeah. but they, you know, it's such a nostalgia-based business. And there's so many people yeah. like me who haven't ever really grown up i might have a wife and kids in the business but i'm still that eight-year-old boy who you know yeah uh, lo loved watching watching these characters and it's such a thrill to see you know people like yourself get your you know get the recognition and it's and it's so sad when it's left too late and people yeah are, you know are inducted posthumously and don't get that moment which has happened you know talking about randy savage earlier it's happened far too many times that people you'd love to see oh on that God. stage get over cheers getting it yeah. when it's too late so um i i, I think it's going to be a really really I, I haven't been this excited to be a mainstream wrestling fan in in decades and it's big part and parcel of why i'm doing this now because i think wrestling has been treated with so much more respect mainstream respect yeah. than it has been in such a long time and it and it's great to see as someone who who weathered you know, being a WWF fan in 1995, which was not an easy time to be a fan. Um, you know, I've, I've, and I've, I've gone through a few cycles of poor creative and pretty, right. yeah, pretty dire product at times. And I've stuck with it through thick and thin and to see where it's at now is, is um, incredible. But I wanted, before we wrap up, there's a, there's a match I've got to ask you about an event um, because this, this is where it all started for me. So SummerSlam 1992 um, you and Kona Crush had a one-on-one -on -one match. Obviously, your your old uh, demolition uh, partner. You'd go head to head at Wembley Stadium. Um, oh, geez. yeah. Do you have Do you have some memories of kind of coming over to London for that show? Because that show has such a special place in the fans of you know in the memories of UK fans. Well, you know, I never ever thought that I'd be wrestling Crush, and when Vince said, he goes. Barry, he says, how would you like to wrestle Brian Adams' crush at Wembley Stadium? I said, I would be honored to. Because one of the greatest things in wrestling is when you wrestle your friends, you know. And it was like when we wrestled the Road Warriors. You know, I grew up with those guys. You know, I wrestled Kurt Hennig, grew up with him. It's so much fun to be in there with your friends and goof around and joke. You know, because you have a really good time in there. And that's how me and Crush were. We... We had a really good time. It was, it was actually kind of, you know, pretty nervous because Wembley Stadium what was there seventy thousand people or something. Mm -hmm. I, I can't remember what it was. That was the big show, you know, one of the biggest shows that I've ever been on. And here I'm wrestling my old partner, and he's no longer a green wrestler. He's he's a professional wrestler, mm -hmm. and I remember we were in the locker room and I said. Brian, you have to press slam me. And he said, Barry, I can't press slam you. You know, and I was, you know, 300 pounds then, you know. And he says, oh, yeah, I'll help you. You'll, you'll get me up there. 
So he had me up in that press slam, and I'm looking down at him, and I said, you see, I knew you could do it. And he started kind of laughing when he threw me. But that that was one of the memories I had with him when I'm up in a press slam and tell him, you see, you did it. And he started laughing, and he couldn't hold me up anymore. He had to slam me. So that was pretty fun, you know. And I what, remember what that moment time. so well. I mean, it, that, that moment's immortalized on a, on a trading card that I still got at home. I remember that that shot of yep. you know, him, ha- him yep. having you up there. Yeah, no, incredible. And of course, yeah, your you job, go, going back to what we said earlier, your job is to make him look good, isn't it? You know, he's a yep. pretty pretty new character trying to introduce this Hawaiian monster of crush. And your job is to make him Get look him like a, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, the one thing that I'm disappointed in more than anything, though, and, and you know, I probably shouldn't even say it, but I, I'm really disappointed in Vince. Because Vince built this thing and was a genius getting it all going and everything. And what he's done in his personal life to this business is terrible. And and I've always liked Vince, but I'll tell you what, he did the worst thing ever with this sex scandal and all this stuff. I, I I'm really disappointed with him. Because he could even make it so much bigger than it is now, you know, and and it's it's just a bad thing. I I, I hate it. Yeah, it's um, it's been a it's been a dark period to weather as a fan, and it yeah, it, it's 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 kind of takes you right back in 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 many regards to the, you know, the the awful the awful Benoit situation in two thousand and seven, like very different thing. But when it becomes very hard. For a period to enjoy the product because you're aware yep. of forces outside of it, and um, right. I, I, I could I could feel its shadow over over WrestleMania, um, and it's going to take a long time for that damage to be undone. Right. And, and 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 unlike with 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 Benoit, where WWE had the ability to to somewhat. Um, expunge him from the history books to a degree you can't do that with Vince McMahon you you, you literally no, can't no. <laughs> but you know what it's it's such a big product and there's such you know Triple H and you know Vince's daughter and you know everybody else they're so big too they're going to make this thing happen mm-hmm. and keep it going and you know the new owners and everything it's so big it, it isn't going to go down it's only going to get better Yeah. so that, that's yeah. the only thing yeah, no, I get that, and and hard when you've obviously known someone personally yeah. as well, of course. But yeah, but I I just have to say, uh, I'm proud to be saying that I was a professional wrestler. I mean, uh, you know, my whole career I couldn't say that, but I can say that now. Looking back, looking at all the guys, they're great guys, and you know, like you're saying, you you're with Al Snow, Al Snow, great guy. Yeah, you know, just I can just all these guys that you meet, they're they're like my best friends. I haven't even met them yet. Yeah, because it's just that that group of guys. So, and I and I feel the same doing what I do for a, for a living now through this. Like the, I feel like I know you, even though this is our first conversation. Really, you know, first proper conversation yeah. because I've I've watched you for so long, and I I love being able to slot straight into conversations with this because I have so many memories of the guys that entertain me when I was younger. Um, what what would you say? looking back on your wrestling life i mean we we've there's so much to talk about you know and there's only so much time we haven't even got on to wcw that's that maybe is a conversation for another day uh maybe, another we'll, do day. A, maybe we'll do a part two barry but um when you look back at your wrestling life what are you what are you proudest of having achieved what i have achieved mm. well my my goal was to become a professional wrestler and to become one in the wwe and i became that and while I was in the wrestling, I wanted to be the best that I could, and and I think I was. I, I, I did exactly what I wanted to, and I really have to be proud to be able to do that. And the biggest thing is I, I have a son that I love, and I have a wife that I've been married to for almost 39 years. So that's a huge accomplishment, being a professional wrestler. And uh, I, I just have so many friends that I'm blessed. I, I tell my I tell my son all the time. I've had the greatest life out of anybody. I you know I have him. I have my wife. I have God, and I have a million friends. And I made it in wrestling. 
So what else could you do? Amen, brother. That is that is that is it really, isn't it? You've you've you know, you've done it all. Yeah. Ben, it was great meeting you too, you know. It's well, absolutely we'll, we'll, we'll see each other again too in person. We will. We will make that happen. I can't wait for you to come out to the UK, Barry. I know a lot of fans would love to see you. I plan I plan on being there and I, I think I'm gonna bring my wife this time. And I uh, keep telling her how nice it is. And she's never been to London. She's been to Germany and all different other places, but never been there. And, and I'm going to bring her there. So we're, we're going to have a good time. We'll make it happen. I'll be your tour guide. I need a big, tall one. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, I've got a couple of thank yous to round out. I mean, firstly, thank you to you, Barry. It's been an absolute pleasure. You know, I could talk to you all day and share memories. So we'll have to do another one of these at some point and dive a bit deeper into Love to. Life after WWFE, whatever we want to call it. Um, but thank you to Barry. Thank you to my producer, Jeff Easton from Tall Lake Productions for bringing wrestling life to life. He will do a great job with the edit of this with lots of lovely demolition and repo man shots throughout. Um, thank you to all of you for joining us. Um, please do subscribe to the show. Find us on social at Wrestling Life Online. Tell a friend and help Wrestling Life to grow. Um, We'll be back soon for more real talk from real talent. Until then, please be good to each other, pay it forward, and I'll see you all soon.